And look, it's really great to start this conference with this panel. We're really excited to be here. And you know, many of you have been, I'm sure, thinking about and hearing about diversity and the um, both sort of social and ethical reasons to have diversity in your team and the commercial reasons to have diversity in your team for a while. Um, I'm really proud that our industry is starting to take this seriously um, and really get to work on building diverse talent pools inside finance and technology. Um, but building those tools is a skill. And so, you know, in some ways, it, it doesn't matter what you think about the imperative. It matters what you actually do with your day to build a diverse team. So what I thought we could do today is help with the skill building that you need if you want to build and diverse, build and retain a diverse team. Um, and for myself, every time I've needed to learn a new skill, what have I done? I've found experts who know how to do that and asked them to help me. And I'm certainly not an expert in, in building and retaining diverse teams. It's something I'm passionate about, something I've worked on, but certainly not something I would say uh, is as strong as you know, my C++ programming even. So I turned to experts when I wanted to learn how to think about this problem. And two of those experts have agreed to join me today. We have Sheila Saram and Netta Jenkins, who have spent substantial parts of their careers, not just thinking about why we should have diverse teams, not just thinking about the 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 social ethical and moral implications of it but also thinking about the mechanics what do you actually do to make our workplaces seem more attractive to diverse individuals and be more attractive to diverse individuals and how do you use that to make a vibrant and exciting organization that doesn't just meet some checkbox that your boss's boss's boss asked you to meet, but actually makes a better company through having a better talent pool and a better culture for your workplace. And so that's the themes we're going to be working with today. And I wanted to take a couple of minutes for Netta and Sheila to introduce themselves and talk about the work they've done. And then I'm going to ask a couple of framing questions that are going to guide our conversation for the 30 minutes we have here. And so with that, uh, Netta, why don't we start? Uh, maybe you could uh, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and how we got here. Sure, thank you, Paul. Um, so I've been advising corporations and audiences of all kinds for years on the most effective strategies to address systemic gaps in the workplace, uh, its traumatic impact, and also the path to change. Uh, my greatest impact is in the corporate workspace, especially in technology. And so I've been recognized for my work in Forbes, CNN, and and more, but currently I'm vice president of global inclusion for a leading technology company in Cork. And I'm also the co-founder of Dipper, which is a data review recruiting technology platform for professionals of color to share workplace experiences and to also be guided to a better workplace one review at a time. And so with Dipper companies also have the ability to increase representation by being at the forefront of diverse talent pools. Companies now give their employees of color access to a third party hotline resources and retention generator to really share their experiences. And companies will receive data and insights to measure where they stand and how they can improve to be sustainable through Dipper. Um, and we have thousands of members. So many people know me through my thought provoking content on LinkedIn with over 25,000 followers and really drawn to my knowledge and insights on the very topic that we're going to be discussing today, um, as well as some key topics around corporate accountability and leadership authenticity, um, as well as product inclusiveness and more. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Sheila. Sure, um, I am Sheila Saram. I'm the founder of Project BASTA. We are a nonprofit that uh, connects first-generation college students with employers who are looking to um, build more inclusive hiring practices. Um, my career started off in tech. So I worked in tech in Western Europe uh, for several years and then um, transitioned into political organizing. Um, from there, I um, ran all of talent acquisition for um, a school district and then a national network of charter schools. And all of that sounds quite circuitous, but it is the culmination of those experiences that made it very clear to me that an organization like Boston needed to exist. Um, and so my lens today in this conversation will be really um, BASTA works with a network of employers, and so I have really an, um, a unique and exciting perch where I get to see how different employers are approaching this move to building more diverse teams. And so 
hoping to pull from some of the best practices and some of the sort of lessons learned as we've worked with various employers across the last four years. Yeah. And so look, between Netta and Sheila, between the two of you, you've you know helped you know thousands of individuals find their way to jobs or better careers and you know tens and hundreds of corporations make workplaces that are more inclusive right? a real direct experience in what we're talking about today and you know for our audience who's facing the the desire to build a more inclusive workplace to retain diverse talent to find diverse talent you know sort of placing myself in in the 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 the, the shoes of our audience members i thought there were sort of three topics we could focus on today the first is, you know, how do you find diverse talent? Right? One, of, one of the things I uh, remember from my time at Goldman when we were working hard on uh, uh, thinking about our diversity programming was the obvious statement that if you want to have a diverse workforce, you need to interview diverse individuals. And if you want to interview <laughs> diverse individuals, you need to find diverse individuals who want to interview with you, right? Um, but, you know, that sort of mechanical and uh, mechanical approach seems naive, but it's actually, it actually works pretty well, right? Where, where is the diverse talent? How do you find them? But then also, how do you differentially attract individuals to your organization, right? Getting folks to join uh, an organization is always hard. What are some of the things that, uh, as we look to expand our talent pool, may really be uh, attractors to individuals? Right? What are some of the things that you can do as a manager or you can do as an organization to help win in this competitive hiring environment? And then the third thought is, you know, we, we seem to uh, we seem to forget that once you've once you've found uh, once you found individuals to join your company, you also need to retain them. And, you know, there's obviously the things that everyone cares about in their job, compensation, respect, interesting work. But there are some other things I think we have done systemically inside financial services that's made it a little bit difficult for us to build and retain diverse talent pools. And so what are some of the sort of top tips that you would have once you've gotten past the moment of finding a person, convincing them to work for you, deciding they're a fit, hiring them, putting them in your organization, and then keeping them for a long and successful career with your team? And so, you know, I, I want to try and keep us concrete like that. Um, so with that, look, let me, Sheila, you've spent a lot of time. Um, you've placed, I think, 300 young people in the last couple of years in jobs in New York City in various, in various uh, roles. Maybe you should talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, the, the talent marketplace at the beginning of careers. And Netta, you have a network with a thousand individuals in it, and you've seen them at all points in the career. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the diverse talent pool as people get further along their careers when we want to think about that first question. Sheila? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I want to just steal a word from your intro, uh, which was social capital. Um, and so I think, you know, the first thing that, that, we, that we see, and we all know intuitively, is that um, we tend to have friends, associations who are um, like-minded, who run in the same circles as us, who maybe have the same political affiliations as us. This is a pretty common, I think, intuitive thing as we're thinking about our lives. And the same thing happens at work. And so um, I think what tends to happen is um, people need to hire. It feels urgent. And they go to somebody they know or they go to a network they know. And so I think the organizations that we work with, I think, number one, have been incredibly intentional about figuring out how to have more diverse networks and affiliations ready to go when they need to hire. And that does require some relationship building ahead of the moment of, oh, man, I need to hire right now. Let me just like ask this person I know who's really great. And I, I'll just trust that the person that they're going to send me is great. So um, I think that's something that we've seen across the organizations that we work with, being really intentional about building associations, affiliations, networks, showing up in places where perhaps they hadn't otherwise. Um, I know that this is a mixed audience. I think for uh, folks who are managing recruiters or managing the people that hire, give them the latitude to do that. Let, let them take the risks, let them go outside of them beyond the places they would usually go. Because I think what we see is a lot of recruiters believing there's sort of a scarcity of diverse talent. And I think there's a scarcity of diverse talent because they're going to the same pools over and over again. And all of these recruiters on top of each other are going to the same pools over and over again. So I think there, I, I, I'd really, you know, just advocate for sort of how are you broadening the number of affiliations that your company has and how are you giving the recruiters and the people who have to do the relationship building the latitude to go beyond where they usually go. Um, and very specifically, 
Um, I think there's sort of three things that we see come up when we talk to employers um, that really hamstrings like who they can hire and who they look for. And that's GPA, where a young person went to college and what previous internships they've had. And if you think about that, GPA, where you went to college and what previous internships you've had, those sort of assumptions or those, those proxies of success are built on the assumption that a young person chose the best college they got into. A lot of times the students we work with aren't choosing the best college they got into. They're choosing the college that's most affordable or closest to home. So they, they had no idea that picking you know, a CUNY college or SUNY college would put them at a huge disadvantage even though they got into NYU. So I think there's a lot to do around how do we broaden the number of colleges that we recruit from, not assuming that the student is necessarily, um, you know, the college they, they went to is the best college they could have gotten into. Um, I think the GPA one is huge. We hear it a lot. Um, and, you know, I think the, 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 the place I'd urge people to really think about is, um, you know, the student who's working 40, 50 hours a week while going to college doesn't have every spare moment to study. So how are some other ways that we can measure or get what we're getting from GPA? What, how do you use GPA? Is it a measure of smarts? Is it a measure of hard work? How can you use some other measures beyond GPA? And then I think the third thing around, um, you know, brand name internships, when you're thinking about um, diverse talent, there's a subset of diverse talent that is first-generation college students. There's four and a half million first-generation college students right now actually in college across America. And a lot of those students are working full-time. So instead of looking for the brand name internship, um, what are some other ways to sort of get at some of the same things that you look for when you look at a resume for a brand name internship? So, um, you know, I think those are the three things uh, that I would really focus on or that I see the companies that we work with really grapple with how are they being consistent about broadening the affiliations that their company has? So when it comes time to hire, they can sort of cast a wide net. How are they giving their recruiters or the people that do hiring the latitude to quote unquote take risks or to sort of be more broad and, and, and creative in how they uh, source talent? And then the third is just taking a hard look at these really, um, I think these proxies that were built around a student who, you know, went to the best college they could got into, got into, didn't have to work, could spend all their time studying and sort of securing summer internships. And unfortunately, if we're using those proxies, it's very hard to to hire um, hire a more sort of a broad group of young people who have a different set of backgrounds and experiences. Yeah, you know, one of the things, Sheila, you've helped me really understand is being empathetic for the differences in experience students in college have and then evaluating those potential differences against your resume screening mechanisms, you know, that alone can help you take a great person off a stack of resumes that you otherwise might not have, right? Take them off and hire them, not take them off and dismiss them, you know, obviously. Um, and so I think you're exactly right, you know, being, being empathetic about how that person came to the point where they are in their life and then figuring out if your evaluation framework matches that path very powerful but you know i think i think at mid-career um or further on in the career path as well there's other challenges and netta you've spent so much time with with professionals who are at all points in their career what do you what do you think you would give us a, a advice to organizations that wanted to recruit and retain diverse talent perhaps with you know eight or ten years experience or someone who has you know become a successful salesperson and you want to recruit into your organization or a successful technologist who you would like to be your VP of engineering or some such some such sort yeah. of later career moment. Yeah, absolutely. I so my background is in behavioral psychology and communications. And so, you know, many times I like to take leaders and, and recruiters uh, really on a deeper path of self-reflection. And I say that there are major steps that many leaders and even recruiters miss. It's self-reflection, intention, and then action. So self-reflection is really defining what diversity means, right? We throw this word around, hey, how do we increase diverse talent? What does that even mean, right? Who is underrepresented or even missing from your company? And then you wanna identify who's in your own personal network. And a hint and, and something that I like to take leaders through in an exercise is really looking on or within your own network, let's say LinkedIn and counting the number of women, black, Latinx, indigenous and other people of color, right? This is an exercise that can really help to discover part of one's issue and then reflect on your past job. So is there anyone of color that you can refer or that is even a woman? If not, then why didn't you speak up then, 
right? So there's this whole self-reflection process. And when you think of a woman, which race or ethnicity immediately comes to mind? Then phase two is really apply intention, right? So you wanna set your commitment to connect with underrepresented people you worked with in the past, but you wanna thoughtfully ask if they'd be willing to help you. And if so, ask them how they felt by your association, especially how they were treated by you. And then you wanna to commit to creating change within yourself. Be intentional in your commitment to equity, right? Identify the inequitable practices at your company that would deter, prevent, or even disadvantage someone from landing a role with you. And then phase three is you wanna then take that action based on what you've learned. So you want to attend conferences that are focused on people from underrepresented groups in the tech or finance space on a monthly basis. A lot of the times what I tend to see is that um, many organizations want to increase diverse uh, diversity, right? Or diverse talent, but there is a lack of attendance in terms of the level of conferences that they're attending that are very specific to those underrepresented populations on a regular basis, right? So many companies are creating moments, but they're not creating the movement. And that's the missing piece there. And I think this is much easier to do now with virtual conferences and webinars. And then, then one needs to take a look at retooling their job requisition for outdated possible discriminatory language and think deeply about the years of experience you're asking for, right? So you may be looking for a senior level uh, technologist, but think about the, the years, think about the possible um, um, inequities that that person may have faced or the barriers they may have faced uh, to even gain uh, or get into that industry. And then you wanna connect with many people, of course, from underrepresented groups um, and really begin building your own personal pipeline so that you have your own candidates ready to go. Um, and, and you know that is the deep work that um, my team and I have done and we continue to do not only only at a court all day with diving in and self-reflecting and saying, hey, what do our personal pipelines look like, right? What have I done? It's really about that phase. And then you can start thinking about how do I strategize to kind of pull in those folks? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think that point, oh. Oh. I, I, th I think a point both of you made as well about job description and GPA and requirements and how that reflects into your network. That's super important as well. One of the things I often help people do when they come to me with the job description is, remove the things they don't want right you know it, like it, we think yep. we think we, we think that a job description is a way to uh advertise everything you need to know but what it really is <laughs> is it's a block that will stop some people from applying um you know exactly. for those for those of us who have looked at this space we all know there, there are stats you know um you know uh, white guys will look at a job where they have six of the ten applications and think they're overqualified and diverse candidates will look at the same job and think they're underqualified right and so, you know, right. I, I, think, I think each of those moments, right, where you're figuring out how am I going to represent myself to these uh, individuals and what are all the touch points, what are all the empathy I have to their experience, I think is a very powerful way to think about some of the mechanics. Right. And I think also, Paul, it's about thinking creatively, right? At Uncork, we, you know, we've been diving into the research and we understand that specifically for women, right? If women take a look at a job, um, requisition and we don't see that we fit all of the requirements, we may not apply, right? And so what we're thinking about now is how do we introduce video job uh, requisitions, right? So that now people have the ability to find out who is that hiring manager? What does that hiring manager value, right? What does that hiring manager really need? <laughs> what are what can they be a bit more flexible on? A lot of the times in the process, especially for underrepresented people, you just don't know what you're getting yourself into, right? So you land the opportunity, you're finally in that job, and you're like, oh crap, <laughs> I did not expect this, right? So I think um, you know from the beginning stage to really understand who is that person, what are they flexible on, is really critical. And so those are some of the things that we're looking into at Uncork right now.
Yeah, and, and let me let me directly address the audience on this. When 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 the three of us are talking about here are questions that you could ask about your process. The people we're talking to are you. The next time someone comes to you and says, "Here's your here's your book," and I screen out everyone with a GPA below three seven, you could say, "Why?" Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and you know, I think for for those of us who found ourselves in leadership positions in the industry. Um, an enormous amount of change can be affected just by starting to ask questions, right? Okay, here's, thank you for this pile of resumes. Where did we go to find these candidates? That simple question will begin to affect change. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, look, um, as we expected, we are going to run incredibly over time. And there are a million things that we haven't talked about. It's already 9.33. Um, Look, I wanted to, to, to uh, and we'll go to the Q&A room where we can talk to people more at length about these topics. I did want with the, with the full audience here for you to both reflect quickly on two things. Um, the first is, um, uh, what do you think is the most important part of having your organization be welcoming to diverse talent? And that's a massive question and I'm going to ask you to answer it in a short amount of time. And secondly, you know, what would you hope that people who listen to this talk uh, go away, uh, what would you hope that people who have listened to this talk uh, go away and change in their, go away and change in their day? I can, I can take the, I can take the, I think the first and second, I think I'll remember mm -hmm. both. Um, so I think I, I want to build on something that Netta shared and Paul, this is related to your first question about like how you can really keep and, and attract talent. Um, so this idea of like examining your organization's practices. So one of our partners um, who is a FinTech company um, was really struggling with why they weren't hiring more diverse tech talent. They had a more diverse tech talent that they would advance to a sort of technical screen, if you will. So a couple of engineers sat in the room for a month and observed the tech interviews to understand what was going on because the assumption had been these students aren't as prepared. They don't have the technical chops to join our company. What they realized after a month of observing interviews was these students had gone to schools that had not um, shared with them what the tech interview is like. The tech interview is unlike any other interview. You're showing your work. You're like showing your process. And what they realized was, wow, these schools these young people attend do not prepare them, do not give them these kinds of simulations. And that was unbelievably helpful for them because what they realized they wanted to do for students who came from schools that didn't necessarily focus on tech was help the young people do several prep interviews to sort of help them understand how the tech interview works. That's huge. Like that level of curiosity to, to sort of Netta's point around like, what is the assumption I'm making? How do I check that assumption? And then how do I like, you know, make sure that I'm right or wrong? Um, I think applies both during hiring, but also once you sort of have a more diverse workforce as you're thinking about what kind of assumptions am I making about how this person communicates in a meeting or how they follow up with me. So I just wanted to share that example because I think for those folks who are doing tech hiring, that sort of there's an assumption that diverse talent doesn't have the sort of the tech chops. There might be other sort of underlying things happening. And mm -hmm. then um, for me, the sort of big advice, I just exactly what Paul said, whatever your or whatever your role is in the organization from senior to senior, go find out how your talent operation is assessing talent, ask them the tough questions. What are they using as a first cut screen and really make sure that that actually makes sense for the kinds of talent you wanna bring in the door. Yeah. All right, Netta, I would love to hear your answer to that. Unfortunately, Mitra is playing the uh, playing the music. Uh, and so it's time <laughs> for us to hop into the Q&A room. Uh, glad to hop into the Q&A room and uh, continue this conversation with anyone who wants to join us.